You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin. Ether, Solana, Doge, and more. Cryptocurrencies and digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments throughout the world's leading crypto derivatives markets. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on The Crypto Rundown. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of crypto derivatives. It's time for The Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Crypto Rundown. You might be saying to yourself, wow, wait a minute, what's this? We just did this show yesterday, and yes, you are correct, listeners, but we're adding a little bit of fun this week, stretching things out. Yesterday, kind of the Just the Facts, ma'am, edition, breaking down all the action out there in the big dogs, the Bitcoin, and the ETH, the volume, the volatility, the skew, all that fun stuff going on there. But today, extending things out this week, rolling out a very special edition of the Crypto Hot Seat. So let's see who's joining us today. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the, the Crypto, Crypto Hot, Hot Seat. seat. All right, everybody, welcome to the Crypto Hot Seat, the portion of the show where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of crypto derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. And today's guest, an old friend of the network, even though he hasn't been on in quite some time, and his title has changed once or twice or 10 times since the last time we chatted with him. It's our old friend, Mr. Boris Ilyevsky, now the head of the Coinbase Derivatives Exchange, Boris Welcome to the Crypto Rundown and to the Crypto Hot Seat for the first time, sir. Hey, Mark. Uh, glad to be back. Always uh, always looking forward to speaking with you. It, it has been too long, but glad to be here. Yes, I think the last time you chatted with us was back in your ISC iteration, unless you made a pit stop in between. I'm trying to think back, but it, it has been some time. And of course, you're on a new show a very different show than on our old interview show you may have appeared on back in the past. Obviously, a new listening audience who probably most of them weren't around the last time you joined us. So let's start there. It's your first appearance on this show. Give our listeners an overview of your background in the options and derivative space, as well as what the heck it is you do day to day over there at the Coinbase Derivatives Exchange. Happy to do so, Mark. And, and, and if you ever start yet another show on another industry, I will make a point of making yet another change in my career <laughs> just, just so that I could be on just every to jump show. on that one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So 
uh, as um, uh, as you know, uh, I come from the land of equity derivatives. I was an options guy for uh, almost 17 years. And so that is where I come from. I'm an exchange guy through and through, spent the bulk of my career at a place called ISE, as you mentioned, which was the first all electronic options exchange in the U.S. I then had a stint at IEX, uh, the Flash Boys. Uh, exchange. And I was there for a couple of fantastic years and got to know those guys and, and spent some time in the cash equities world. And then I ended up at a company, a startup called Ferex, which is a startup futures market. And we were acquired by Coinbase uh, just about a year and a half ago. And here at Coinbase, I am the head of the U.S. futures exchange that we call Coinbase Derivatives derivatives exchange. And so now I am officially a futures guy. Look at you. It all comes full circle at the end of the day, all the way back around. That's right. <laughs> well, let's get into some of that fun. A lot of our listeners might be saying Coinbase derivatives exchange. What the heck are these guys talking about? As you mentioned, you got some futures up your sleeve, but for some of our listeners who are not familiar, what can they trade? What's going up over there at the Coinbase derivatives exchange these days? So we are uh, just a regular, traditional, in a way, CFTC registered designated contract market. So we have the same status as the other futures exchanges in the land, like the CME and ICE and a couple of others. We have a clearing house partner, which is Nodal Exchange, which is part of the old Deutsche Börse group. They are our fantastic clearing exchange. And what we list currently are Bitcoin and Ethereum futures, all cash settled, and they come in two sizes. Uh, we list a very small version uh, we refer to as the Nano Bitcoin and Nano ETH contracts. And we more recently listed a slightly larger, more institutionally focused contract, uh, which is a full Bitcoin contract, as well as a 10 ETH uh, contract. So Today, what people can trade on our exchange are those two sets of products. You know, we hear from our listeners all the time because we have guests from all over the world on this show uh, every week. And a lot of them write in and say, these guests are amazing. They have so many great products, but we can't touch them here in the U.S. Just had the folks from Darabin on a couple of weeks ago. Same deal there. They do a ton of volume. None of our U.S. listeners <laughs> can even think about touching those things without violating a whole bunch of terms of service and EULAs and everything else. So a lot of our listeners may be surprised that you are regulated here in the U.S. They can come trade these contracts over there on Coinbase a U.S. derivatives, sir. So probably a nice, refreshing surprise for a lot of our listeners, Boris. Yeah, absolutely. These are specifically uh, approved uh, both for U.S. and, and non-U.S. Uh, participants who have relationships with U.S.-based futures commission merchants. So we have a decent amount of distribution in the U.S. So if you are a U.S. client and you're familiar with uh, brokers like Ninja Trader and Tradeabate and, and various brokers that, uh, and customers that come to us via Stonex and uh, Wedbush and Ironbeam, if you are a client of uh, one of these firms and we're working to expand that group of brokers every day, then you have access to our products and you can trade them. They are margined. Uh, they are uh, just like any traditional U.S. futures product. And your FCM will have whatever commissions they charge, whatever margins that they afford you, whether it's overnight margin that we set here at the exchange on the clearinghouse level and whatever day trader margin that some brokers offer. But, yeah, absolutely. These products are available to all U.S. people. So there you go, listeners. Everyone can play, not just our international listeners who seem to get their hands and everything out there these days. But you mentioned you were acquired a little over a year ago by Coinbase. It's been an intriguing year. Of course, beginning of this year, we saw a pretty aggressive run up out there in both Bitcoin and ETH. And whenever we see these products rallying, it usually tends to drive some volume, drive a little bit more interest in these products. So looking back now a year plus into the acquisition, how are the volumes on these products over there at Coinbase Derivatives? Sir? So the volumes have been pretty good, a little bit slower now in the summer. You're seeing sort of volume slow down. I don't know. Your other guests must be talking about it as well. Uh, so in terms of spot volumes and even derivatives volumes worldwide, crypto volumes have slowed down a little bit, even as prices have uh, have appreciated quite dramatically over the last six months. But yeah, during those volatile times from a few months ago, we had some fantastic volumes. We had days of uh, trading of several hundred thousand contracts. 
We had days where we traded in notional uh, well over 100, a couple of times, I believe we traded a couple of hundred million dollars worth in crypto, as you probably know, and your listeners know, uh, we like to measure stuff in notional uh, value, not just in terms of contract wise. So the volume's been pretty good. Open interest has been growing. And by the way, all of the volume figures that I'm quoting, just like every other U.S. derivatives exchange regulated by the CFTC, we publish our volumes on our website uh, every day. You can uh, you can find them uh, at coinbase.com slash derivatives. So uh, it, it may not be uh, the, the prettiest website in, in the world, but uh, but the volumes are there. The product specs are all there. So everything that I'm talking to you about is definitely out there in the public eye. Also, if you're a professional and you're sitting in front of a Bloomberg terminal or another market data terminal, you can probably find our contracts there as well and, and track the volumes. You mentioned all the other different listed derivatives venues for crypto out there. And that's a fascinating area of the space for me to watch here on the show because crypto, a lot of people like the decentralized nature of it. They come to it. A lot of them are crypto natives. They're not used to this essentially cleared, regulated world. So when we watch a lot of these entities spin up on the listed side, whether it's CME and all of their various offerings, micro and large size contracts on Bitcoin and Ether and everything in between. Or, of course, we had Ledger X that became infamously FTX U.S. derivatives. We, of course, had backed to getting out there. A lot of people have tilted at the listed crypto derivatives windmill with varying degrees of success. Some products you think would be a slam dunk, not really resonating. Others doing all right, then maybe kind of falling off. So it's been a, a challenging environment to kind of get the, the listed crypto derivatives market up and running here in the U.S. I'm curious for you, Boris, you've been in it for a while. Now. Why do you think it's been so challenging to get this listed crypto derivative space up and running here in the U.S.? So I think there's a, a couple of a couple of reasons. Uh, one is the regulatory landscape, as everybody knows, continues to be somewhat unclear. And it has been difficult to get uh, the support of every FCM, uh, a lot of banks, a lot of brokers are still a little bit standoffish when it comes to handling anything related to crypto, even though these are purely cash settled financial uh, futures products. We've made a lot of progress there. But at the same time, uh, some of the margin levels are still not quite as normalized as they could be. A lot of folks are understandably taking a very conservative approach, but I think it's still pretty early on, definitely early on for us. And I think as time goes by and as the market has been quite stable and the volatility has actually declined, I think you'll you'll see the adoption continue to grow. One, you know, very sort of uh, very obvious fact uh, to me and something I think about every day is that for us here at Coinbase, uh, one of the biggest challenges is that we are still awaiting the approval of our affiliate. Uh, that has a pending application with the NFA for an FCN. So right now, Coinbase's own U.S. clients cannot yet access these products through Coinbase. Now, that's I'm on the DCM side, so that entire process is something that is very arm's length for me. I don't actually know uh, where I'm involved in anything that's going on there, but I do know that that approval is still pending, and we're very much looking forward to actually exposing our product to the large Coinbase user base. And I think when that happens, you'll really start to see uh, the adoption uh, take off here in the U.S. And, and I'm really looking forward to that. Opening the floodgates over there. That'll certainly be interesting to see how, how that plays out. Speaking of how things play out, I know as you mentioned at the top of the show, you guys have the cash settled products. For a while there, it was all the physically delivered, physically settled contracts were all the rage. A Ledger X uh, obviously raced into that space, backed infamously, uh, beat them to the punch on that. It seemed like everyone was obsessed with the notion of being able to write covered calls on their crypto and have it be uh, called away. It seemed like that was all the rage. Then those products launched and they kind of met with a bit of a whimper. It does seem like most of the new stuff we're seeing listed, including yours, is all going on the cash settled side. Is that it? Is the, is the physically settled, physically delivered stuff, is that kind of just dead and over? Is that trend done and we've all moved on? Or do you think there is still some demand for people who want to come in and just write the calls and have their underlying taken away, sir? So that, that's a great question. And we think about that all the time. There's a, there's a very specific reason why we at Coinbase and very likely the CME has chosen to go with cash settled products. The, the most important reason is that 
the way that the rules are currently for banks in the U.S. is that FCMs, especially bank-affiliated FCMs, and some brokers that have affiliated bank holding companies cannot really safely touch crypto without it very negatively impacting their balance sheet. So anything related to spot crypto is challenging just from an infrastructure point of view and just from a pipes uh, point of view, even just the possibility of physical settlement, even though we know that in, in real life, even the big physically settled contracts, like the big commodity contracts, rarely ever go to settlement, especially at retail firms. So, so that's one difficulty. The advantage, of course, of physically settled uh, products is that you don't need to worry about the underlying data and index license because you are, at the end of the day, settling to the actual underlying uh, commodity. So that's a huge advantage. But at the same time, because of the way the Bitcoin spot market operates, uh, the difficulties with not just what I mentioned before in terms of FCM supporting spot Bitcoin and what that means at the clearinghouse level, uh, it's, it's also not as conducive to what's fantastic about cash settled products uh, where you, you don't actually ever have to worry about delivering the actual underlying commodity at expiration if you choose to hold it that long. So whatever your view is, whether you're going long or short, everything at the end is cash settled. So that doesn't mean that we don't at some point explore and look to offer a physically settled alternative. But we find that especially having the largest affiliated spot Bitcoin exchange, we have all the correct ingredients for a really solid uh, product that truly lets people uh, express their views and hedge their actual Bitcoin exposure or ex uh, you know, express their views on the price of Bitcoin and ETH. So there's a certain amount of distribution and ease of use that comes with cash settled crypto. So I think that's really where the big growth opportunity is in the U.S. and for U.S. clients. I noticed when you mentioned your products mix at the top of the show, you didn't mention perpetuals. And these have always kind of puzzled me, these products, quite frankly. They seem like a bit of a, a, a surrogate away for some non-listed type exchanges to really kind of approximate some of the functionality, some of the offerings of what goes on in the listed derivatives markets here in the U.S. But I've always found them to be a very head-scratching product. I've tried to explain them a few times to very seasoned people who've been in the derivatives markets for decades, way longer than I have. And when I try to explain it to them, they look at me like I'm a crazy person <laughs> because they, they are a bit of an esoteric product class. I noticed you didn't mention them in your offering, probably because you have listed futures already. But I'm curious for you, what, what are your thoughts on this very unique side of the crypto space? Do you think this was really just their way to approximate something that they didn't have and there's really no demand for these? Or do you think there is interest in keeping these perpetuals going, perpetuating the perpetuals, if you will, sir? Easy for me to say. That's right. That's a good one. So, yes. Is, is the short answer. And as you, as you may know, Coinbase recently launched its non-U.S. exchange uh, called the International Exchange for Non-U.S. Clients, which is a perpetual futures exchange. And that launched a few months ago. And as, as you've seen in some of our public uh, disclosures and, and the earnings that uh, the company reported last week, we, we've seen some decent uh, traction in that product. Again, uh, this is uh, an exchange that's exclusively for non-U.S. Uh, clients because perpetual futures are not uh, a, a product that is legal to offer in the U.S. Uh, to U.S. clients. So the way I like to explain uh, perpetual futures is that they're very similar to another concept, which frankly is, is, is another thing that was attempted in the U.S. a long time ago, primarily with Forex futures uh, that were uh, rolling spot Futures, where the biggest attraction is that the contract uh, is designed in such a way that it excludes any forward pricing attributes of what traditional futures are for. And it uses what, what you could call uh, a forcing uh, mechanism. Uh, it, in, in perpetual futures, you've probably heard this uh, from your uh, other guests, the actual term is a funding rate, but it's effectively a uh, an hourly, sometimes three times in a 24-hour cycle forcing function that ensures that the contract trades around the same price as the spot market. And it's effectively a way to offer futures-like leverage in a cash-like 
uh, product. So uh, I certainly appreciate the attractiveness of this product. I think it has a much more retail lean to it because, again, it's just a way to offer leverage and the ability to go long and short and all the wonderful advantages of futures, but in a product that looks and feels like the spot market. And that was the attempt that I believe the CME and maybe other exchanges attempted years ago and more recently, Eurex uh, has launched uh, FX futures that are effectively not perpetuals. They don't call them that, but they're effectively rolling spot contracts. It's something that we think about uh, every once in a while in the U.S. It's something that we would absolutely want to discuss with the CFTC and our regulators and think about the definitional uh, nature of the product, whether it's a futures contract or a, a swaps contract and, and what that actually means. It does involve a lot of mechanics that make it a little bit more challenging to offer in the traditional rails of the U.S. futures market, but it's definitely uh, an attractive uh, product that uh, currently is really only available to non-U.S. clients. Yeah, the analogy I always make is people who are very familiar overseas, they're used to the warrants markets there because they never really had a robust listed options market to trade. So they, they grew up trading warrants, and that's what they're used to. I, I make the analogy to perpetuals with those as well. If you're not used to a robust listed kind of futures market like we have here, maybe perpetuals make sense, hence the interest overseas. But we'll be interesting to see if you guys can get something going here in the U.S. and if there is an uptake to it because whenever I try to discuss it with anyone here, I, I get a lot of raised eyebrows, Boris. <laughs> what <laughs> language are you speaking, sir? But you mentioned earlier about your, your product mix, how you guys started with the smaller, the more bite-sized, the more retail contracts, and then you scaled it up for the larger institutional funds out there to play with. We've seen a lot of other firms like CME, most infamously, kind of go on the other route. They launched their 5X Bitcoin contract and their large ETH contract, and then eventually scaled it down to their micro size contract. So kind of taking a different trajectory, going big funds first, obviously with the goal to getting some of the ETFs launched, like Bitto, which we did see launched. So from that perspective, I suppose things worked out, but I'm curious for you folks, why did you decide to go the other way? Why start with the smaller, more retail-friendly contracts and then scale up to institutions later? So th that's a great question. And part of it goes back to our roots at, at Ferex, where our goal was to uh, sort of, I hate to use that, that term because it's so overused, but democratize access to futures, which is really just another way of saying appeal to retail uh, clients and and a lot of that carried over uh, when we came over to Coinbase and our first and and foremost target audience was always the the retail uh, client and the retail investor and and that's why we wanted to establish the smaller contract first and, and again CME was already there with the very large contract and then seen some traction and particularly with with uh, with Beto I think they did a fantastic job helping facilitate the launch of that contract. And, and we know that that's, uh, that's a decent amount of workflow uh, that comes in. And we're trying to uh, get a piece of that pie as well with our larger contracts as well. But, but, the, uh, but the primary goal was definitely to uh, attract the retail audience for uh, something that is a, a new uh, commodity, that is a new product and asset class, uh, whether it's for institutional or retail clients, it makes sense to us that we wanted to offer a smaller product, something that lets people kind of dip their toes uh, in the water. And I think uh, that's why we've seen some decent traction in our nano products, because it's just a little bit uh, less of an outlay. It's uh, a lot less uh, intimidating. And uh, our pricing is attractive enough that if you want to trade more, you want to uh, have a more granular outlook in terms of how you scale in and out of positions, a smaller contract lets you do that. But at the same time, we're also recognizing that institutional clients and some of the uh, you know, sensitivities to, to commission structures and other concerns that there's always a need for a larger product when institutional adoption uh, increases. But yeah, that, we definitely chose the smaller product because our primary audience is on the retail side. Speaking of that institutional adoption, that's been one of the ongoing themes of this show ever since we launched it way back in the crazy days of early 2018, right after the big launch of the futures here 
in the U.S. The question everyone was asking is, what are the institutions up to? Are they even interested in this thing, or is it too weird? Is it too esoteric? Is it too Wild West for some of the big funds? We did see a lot of guests over the years coming in who specialize in the institutional space, and we've heard differing things. Yes, they're into it. No, they're not into it. It does seem like that demand ebbs and flows with the value of the underlying. (laughs) So there certainly is some correlation there. But now that you're playing in the larger product space, now that you're catering to more of that institutional side of the space. Uh, what are you hearing and seeing out there from an institutional demand perspective? Are they all in on crypto and Bitcoin again? Are they a little bit Larry? What are you seeing and hearing out there? So it, it's always uh, taking longer than, than, than anybody wants it to. Uh, we've had our larger product for just a couple of months. Uh, we have really good support from our market-making community. Uh, we've seen just a little bit of uptake uh, from a few buy-side clients that have started Uh, trading with us uh, through the FCMs that support us. Again, uh, one of the barriers that we face is that our affiliated FCM is not yet live. So uh, again, clients that rely on Coinbase on the institutional side can't uh, currently use Coinbase to actually access our products. And hopefully that changes very soon. Uh, At the end of uh, the day, um, it, it really is just a matter of time. And uh, we're seeing signs of it now. Uh, Our roster of institutional uh, clients is growing. The number of FCMs that support us has continued to grow. Uh, We're still missing some big bank uh, FCMs that have yet to support us. Um, And a lot of them are waiting for that client demand to materialize in a real way. We're working with third-party providers, uh, front ends like Trading Technologies and, and others, to, uh, to increase access uh, to our exchange through any FCMs that support us. So for us, it's still very, very early, early stages on the institutional uh, side, but, uh, but we're seeing some good initial indications. You touched on the regulatory side a few times. Unfortunately, it's, it's inescapable these days. You can't talk about crypto, at least here in the U.S., without mentioning uh, the flip side of that coin, which is the regulatory side. I haven't chatted with you since this whole FTX debacle went down. It's been fascinating, kind of an infamous spectacle now. Last year, I'm not sure if you were there at the big FIA Expo here in Chicago, but it's the largest listeners, the largest global derivatives conference going out here. And it was terrifying to see you walk into that event and they were hurriedly scraping FTX off the wall. It was, of course, their their marquee sponsor. It showed you just how far reaching the impact of that event was. But for you, particularly now that you're focused on the derivative side of the crypto space, to see their subsidiary, of course, which was Ledger X, became FTX US Derivatives, to see all of them get caught up in all of that madness, I'm sure was particularly alarming. So let's start there. You've been in the derivatives game for a long time. What are your thoughts on that whole debacle? And then because you're now very much in that space, in the crypto derivative space, does that whole meltdown of FTX, does it pose any additional, maybe unanticipated challenges for you guys over there at Coinbase U.S. derivatives going forward? So it's definitely been just a terrible, terrible thing that that happened. And it was, uh, I don't think anybody uh, ever suspected that what FTX was in so many ways ended up just being uh, a criminal enterprise. And and it's just been um, just a very unfortunate thing to happen to the industry. And it definitely slowed down some of that institutional adoption and just uh, everything else uh, around it in the industry. And so it's, it's, it's been absolutely um, a challenge uh, when, when you're talking to people and you're always trying to differentiate uh, not only uh, the company that, that, that we're with, um, but, but even just to uh, separate the industry from, from the person and the specific people involved in the FTX uh, debacle. But uh, what's important to point out, especially for uh, the Coinbase U.S. derivatives um, initiative that that I oversee here, is that uh, we operate in, as as I don't need to tell you, just uh, an extremely well-regulated, well-regimented regime. Uh, We are not... um, uh, using the same model or the same setup by any means that FTX was using. Our futures are uh, offered and operated through the traditional 
uh, U.S. futures traditional rails with a registered uh, futures exchange, a clearinghouse, and probably most importantly, FCM uh, partners and all their protections uh, and risk uh, mechanisms that come with that. So it hasn't been easy. It, it, it's certainly a black eye for uh, for the industry, but but I don't think it's it's going to affect us in the long terms. And we've really embraced um, kind of an open structure for Coinbase Derivatives Exchange. Uh, we started our market, again, well in advance and completely independently uh, from the Coinbase entity that's seeking to become an FCM. Our distribution right now is purely to customers outside of the Coinbase ecosystem, as much as we're quite uh, anxious to offer it to Coinbase clients themselves. But we are very much partnering with the broader FCM and uh, futures brokerage uh, community to to try to grow this business. So, uh, like you uh, mentioned, you know, FDX years ago, but it only happened last year. Uh, I think we're barely just coming up on a year since it happened, but it definitely is beginning to feel like it was years ago. And I think that that also speaks to how quickly the industry moves, and frankly, the fact that I do think we're getting uh, we're getting past it. Obviously, there's continued regulatory uncertainty. Uh, and there's stuff obviously I can't quite comment on that's out of there in the public in the public domain. Uh, but I do think that we have the, all the correct ingredients uh, for a successful U.S. derivatives offering here, and I and I believe we're we're starting to really gain steam here. Well, Mr. Boris, unfortunately, that music means we're running out of time here in the crypto hot seat this week. But we can't leave it on that. That's such a, a dour down note. Well, let's leave it <laughs> on something a little bit more positive, Boris. So we always like to leave our audience wanting more, looking ahead, a little bit excited, a little bit upbeat here on the show. So before we go, uh, Mr. Boris, what can our listeners look forward to coming down the pike from you and the team over there at Coinbase derivatives in the coming months, sir. Now is the time. The floor is yours. Have at it. So, you know, uh, you know, you, you set it up so well, and, and I'm just going to absolutely disappoint you uh, because as a, a regulated uh, exchange and also being part of a U.S. public company, other than to tell you that we're constantly exploring new products and always talking to our regulators about what we can do next, I am absolutely not allowed to tell you anything other than that that hasn't already been uh, publicly disclosed. So uh, I don't know if this means you're going to have to cut this part out and end on the dour note instead of this completely nothing burger that I'm giving you uh, right now. But other than hopefully growing volumes and growing adoption of our Bitcoin and Ethereum futures, uh, unfortunately, there's just nothing else I can share with you at this time as much as I've wanted. So what you're telling me as I read between the lines is Doge options confirmed coming from Coinbase derivatives in the coming months. Is that correct, sir? Absolutely not. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, <laughs> for the Doge army, you have to wait another day. Well, Mr. Boris, I'm glad you That's can right. make it here. Join us on the Crypto Hot Seat. We'll have to chat again more frequently than once every five plus years or whatever it's been here. Get you back on the show with a little bit more regularity to give our listeners a little bit more of an update on what's cooking over there in the land of Coinbase derivatives. But before we go, sir, if our listeners are intrigued, maybe they're hearing about your venture for the first time. They want to go check it out for themselves. Where should they go? What should they do, sir? They should absolutely go to Coinbase.com forward slash derivatives and uh, check us out get in touch with us uh, find a broker that supports our products and go at it there you go so for everyone who's written into us saying man we wish we had more offerings here in the u.s on the crypto derivative side there you go yet another one for you folks to sink your teeth into check them out over there you know where to find coinbase it's pretty easy then just go to uh, the derivatives subsets and you're off to the races unfortunately that's going to do it for us today on the network back again tomorrow for all you pro folks we'll be going live with options boot camp dan back from traveling should be some fun time there on the show of course everyone else get it after the fact on the old network back again on thursday with our double header the option block in the morning with our friends over there at SIBO, followed immediately afterwards by this week in futures options with our friends over there at CME. Back again on Friday with volatility views. And after that, for all you pro folks out there with a little bit of the old options oddities, then back again next Monday, our usual bat time, usual bat channel, another great crypto rundown. Stay safe out there, everybody. 
The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs> 